right. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Hede van Groningen. I'm happy to uh, be welcoming you, welcoming you today at Bak Basis for Actuele Kunst. Uh, thank you all for coming or staying uh, for, to, to, for this evening's presentations by uh, Fran Illick as part of his training, the Diego de la Vega Coffee Co-op Autumn School, where he will talk about his practice, among, among which are the Art, Coffee and Media Cooperative Diego de la Vega Coffee Co-op and a virtual community investment bank called Space Bank. Today we are in the fourth week, training week, um, that takes place within the uh, project Trainings for the Not Yet, an exhibition as a series of trainings for a future of being together otherwise. Uh, it's convened by uh, a multitude of collaborators uh, and by Jeanne van Heeswijk and Bach. And these weekly trainings take place throughout the duration of the exhibition. And it's, these are gatherings uh, during which visitors, artists, international guests, uh, Utrechters, local initiatives and other participants uh, collecti collectively think through and enact alternatives for the future. And if you want to know more about the exciting program of trainings that's coming up, um, walk up to me or my colleagues or uh, get a folder at the reception desk uh, in which they are all listed. Uh, before I give the floor to Fran, um, just a few, few lines to introduce uh, him. Fran Illick is a media artist, essayist, novelist and activist. His work focuses on the theory and practice of narrative media, experimental economies and finance, hacktivism and social organizations. He's the author of novels like Circa, ni Circa 94 from 2010 and Techno Guerrilla from 2008. And he created works of narrative media that range from interactive web telenovelas to experimental theater, alternative re alternate reality, and utopian experiments in social organization. And this said, I'd like to uh, give a warm hand to Fran. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, how are you tonight? Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about my work, uh, particularly the one related to Possible Worlds and Space Bank that started in 2005. Okay. So I'm going to talk about the context. Well, you know, in 1492, the continent was occupied. And there was a clash of values. On the one side, you have um, extractivism and um, money value. And on the other side, you have use of value and a culture of potlatch. Right? So it's not, about, it's not a culture about scarcity, but about abundance. In 1991, the North America Free Trade Agreement, I mean in 1994, they changed the, the economical policies in Mexico so that there wouldn't be credit, bank credit for farm workers uh, in, so that they, there would be a transference of uh, labor from the farms in the southeast all the way to the north where farm workers would now have to become factory workers for the United States, Korea, Japan, etc. So this actually meant that the farm workers would become urban poor or they would have to farm things like marijuana and so on, right? But the corn was still the same. The corn had the same um, nutritional values and everything, but it was worthless as a product. And the, the corn... Uh, since then, it has been planted in the United States, even though the corn was invented in Central America, somewhere between Mexico and Guatemala. Well, many persons talk about how uh, Mexico as a country became independent in 1821, which is kind of a way to put it, because to this day, uh, Spanish banks still have control over the economy in Mexico, particularly this one, BBVA, who is kind of a bankrupt, or it's kind of, kind of like a poor bank in Spain, but still the most money they make comes from the Americas. I have declared the war to this bank because at one time they stole $500 from my account, you know, and they asked, they told me that I actually had released the money and spent it, you know, and it's, it's completely a lie because you cannot uh, take $500 out of 
an ATM in Mexico. It's a different exchange rate. So it would be something like, let's say, 5,114 point something, you know? It was a mess. I did an interactive telenovela about it. Uh, no matter what you decided, it would end up in, uh, in the following. I don't know. I think I don't have it. No. Okay. Hopefully I will have it. So, yes. Yeah, here it is. This is the end, no matter what decisions you took. Oh, I don't have volume, I forgot. Okay, so it was a kind of long telenovela, and in, in, in this particular timeline, would end up with the destruction of, of a BBVA ATM. There, there you have it. We're destroying it, and people will be revolting in the city. You know. So more or less the morale was that no, no matter what option you took, all the paths led to, to this one, right? Yeah. It's a real ATM and yeah, it's really destroyed. Okay, so continuing talking about values, uh, here we have a replica of the Quetzalapanecayotl which is the, the, it's called also the feather crown of Moctezuma. Moctezuma was the last speaker of the Mexicas uh, 500 years ago. And this particular, I mean, this is a replica, but the original one is made out of uh, Quetzal feathers. And the reason why it survived is because Hernán Cortés gave it as a present to, was it Carlos II, Carlos V, no? And it doesn't have much gold, so it didn't represent anything for, for the Austrian house. And so it survived, uh, I think, in a, like in a cabinet of an Austrian count, and it was found in, at the end of the 19th century there. This is a replica, and what we're seeing there is basically the clash of two civilizations that exist in Mexico. You know, so you have the indigenous people just looking like at, at their values, you know, behind a glass, a glass uh, window. So in a way, it's like all of that culture lost its value. You know, it's completely dispossessed. And archaeology was a way to, to freeze all this, all this wealth. They cannot continue doing their religious practices, etc. This is another telenovela. It's called Telenovel Vag. Yes, it's a homage to Jean-Luc Godard. And it deals with the dispossession of farm workers who um, the, gov the government wanted to make like, a, like an airport. And so they decided to buy each square meter for $1. So if you had previously owned 1,000 square meters, now you would get $1,000, right? This telenovela is from 2004. And these are the Zapatistas. Uh, they have been an inspiration all, all along. They have their own service system of clinics, um, education, etc. They're basically self-sustainable, and they have their own values and their own land. This is their school system, and they teach different versions of history that the ones we're used in, uh, we're used to in Mexico, uh, in urban Mexico. They're organized through collectives and cooperatives. And in 2005, I, I, I went to Chiapas to meet with the Zapatistas in order to propose them to do hacktivist projects, interactive telenovelas, and so on. And what I found out is that there was no electricity there. I mean, uh, or there was, but not like in cities. So instead of, of proposing something for, to them, I decided to stay silent and learn. When I left the Autonomous Municipality, I had the idea of setting up a web server. Now, this web server was going to run somehow um, like a, an Autonomous Municipality. So I needed to buy a computer to install some kind of Linux distribution, connect it into the internet, and start populating it. The idea, of course, was to make a startup and to make it work, more or less inspired by the Zapatistas. But I didn't know anything about money, so I decided to start Space Bank. Space Bank is, um, at, this, at that time, was a bank uh, 
who basically was taking care of uh, debits and credits within the project. Uh, the logo uh, imitates the logo of Citibank and it's called Space Bank because it's bigger than World Bank, yes, but also because it's the bank of a space, right? In that case, the server. Also the idea, don't hate the banks, become the banks, right? Yeah. All of a sudden, uh, the web server became, uh, started to become populated and we would charge each collective or artist or magazine $120 to be hosted in the website. I mean, all of a sudden, we started having money. You know, it, it was unbelievable. Before that, we would spend money on the, on the internet. Now we had money. But now that we had money, that was a problem because we could store it in banks, in regular banks like BBVA, and BBVA would use that money to invest it in bonds. So basically, they would lend the money, let's say, to the police. The police would come and beat our people no, and it was kind of like a bad cycle of dependence. So we had the money and we didn't know what to do with it. Okay, so the server slowly starts to get populated by lots of lots of, of projects. And then we decided to fund one of the main of the first projects that we did, which is Piezas del Rompecabeza de la Otra Campaña, where uh, an activist went to travel throughout the country for one year with uh, the Delegate Zero of the Zapatista Army of National Liberation to record all of the conversations of the people of Mexico with SZLN. So this is like uh, an archive of, let's say, 20 gigabytes of, of audio conversations. We created a, a matrix of relations there to show like uh, problems of electricity uh, throughout the country to kind of bring together uh, different people in cities, states, across the nation, so that they would find out what their problem was. In February 2006, our server was blocked by the telephone company of Mexico, Telmex, so that people within the country were not able to access the website or the server, but outside of Mexico, it was perfectly uh, okay. You know? So this is regular censorship in Mexico, right? Keep the appearances outside and uh, attack people inside. Then all of a sudden we had we had some money in the in the account and we tried to open a, like a, an account in an investment bank and we deposited the money but then the banker told us that actually we are part of a terrorist support network and that the, the, the money is frozen right So this was pretty big. Because at that time, I started noticing that actually I was doing something right. You know, I was, I was you know, dealing with money and not with um, imaginary values like uh, identity or you know, some sort of rebelliousness, right? Uh, this is kind of like a Buster Keaton movie because some of the people who were involved with uh, Piezas del Rompecabezas de la Otra Campaña were also defending... Uh, a couple of, of Basque activists who were living in Mexico and they were being accused of belonging to, uh, to ETA. And so at that time I was invited by a group of artists to come to Vitoria Gasteiz in the Basque country. And what was I to, to even imagine that these Basque people were, going, were being extradited on the same plane where I was, and we were going to the same city. So things started to look suspicious from the outside, right? It was kind of possible to believe that we were some kind of terrorist support network. The guy with the red tie, he's Marcelo Ebrard. He's kind of like the minister of... Um, exterior relationships at the moment in Mexico. He also is one of the, he was the mayor of Mexico City. Yeah, he belongs to the left-wing party, but his brother is a PR person for Walmart. You know? So it's really interesting how uh, the government, the three different party, political parties in Mexico were attacking the other campaign, uh, and they would never mention that they're part of, of, of you know, that, that the relationships with real money are so close. You know? This is what happened in Atenco on May 1st, I think, May 1st, um, 2006. 
45 women were raped by uh, three levels of police, state, municipal, and federal. And uh, the three main parties were involved. Now, this is because of a protest against Walmart you know, the, that the brother of Marcelo Brad represents you know, as a lawyer. So by this time, the Zapatistas had already moved to our server as a token of trust, you know, which meant that there was also an online attack. Our server was attacked every other three minutes and it would fall down. You know? So I started panicking. You know, I saw the apartment. Where, where, where can I run? Should I, should I jump over the wall? What can I do, right? And all of a sudden, I, I realized that I couldn't communicate with anyone throughout electronic networks or telephone calls, so I needed to see people in, in real life to tell them, you know, things are going really wrong. But at that point, you start to find out that you actually can't trust anyone, right? Because there's undercover people also. So we continued doing this kind of work, and uh, there were many discussions about the creation of another culture within the Zapatista movement. And um, within possible worlds, we started to ask ourselves if actually the other culture or the other art existed. So we placed a call for works, asking people for text about their experiences with this kind of work, to see if it actually had some existing result or if it was just an imaginary mantra that we were repeating to ourselves to believe that we are in the right path. It, this was really great because the Zapatistas answered with a, with a panel called, is another culture possible? So it felt like we're kind of in a dialogue with, with I don't want to say peers, but with our heroes, no? so to say. Yeah, then we were invited to Documenta, and this was really cool because a lot of Mexican uh, cultural workers who work for the state, yet they are supposed to be independent, yet they receive funding from the state and do art that is okay for the state, were, were really angry with us because we were in, being invited to Documenta. So they told us, you have to resign. You cannot go because you are supposed to be Zapatistas. But for us, it's also really important to do this in, because the battle also happens like on a cultural ground and they were not being invited. So that was, that was also important. We continue doing telenovelas, Televisa, uh, which is a big television company in Latin America. All of a sudden, they thought that they own the meaning of words like rebel or ugly, right? So these telenovelas were kind of reinterpreting those meanings. Rebelde, instead of being about some rich kids who are driving fast in the main boulevards of Mexico City, was about indie media uh, journalists who are kind of going to really boring meetings, you know, doing minutes and interviewing people, right? These telenovelas were posted daily on YouTube, and they were taken down because the last three episodes, I mean, Shakira, the pop singer, was coming to Mexico City. And we decided to mention that we were going to take hostage Shakira, right? So the fan club of Shakira uh, sort of became our enemy during that time. And uh, the last three, two chapters, I think, they're, they were recorded in the Shakira concert in, in, in Mexico, City with, Mexico City with Shakira singing in the main square of the city. And uh, the the actors being uh, below, and this was also very cool. Not only because the fan club eventually was on our side when YouTube deleted the the videos, but also because we found out that the main square was already um, under control of Televisa, a television company, which meant that the Mexico City left wing, meaning Marcelo Brad, who was before in the screen, had give the rights to any cultural thing that happened there to Televisa. So Televisa basically could sue us just for recording in the Zócalo without asking for their permission. There was this, the idea back then uh, through, like let's, let's say, the Mexican young um, cultural intelligentsia that there was no censorship in Mexico. And, and it appeared that way, maybe because novels and art had become more or less irrelevant. But people like Brad Will were killed uh, by doing his indie media coverage by a group of paramilitary people. So, and a lot of radio stations were closed at the time. So there was the question, is there like censorship or 
there is no censorship? Why are these people being killed? And especially, why are the artists not attacked? Maybe because they, start, they started to not be relevant in such a reality. This is the server, no? Then around that time, we also started a healthcare program that I mentioned in the, last, in the past days. Basically, it was run as a mutual fund. The consults were a dollar, and the proceedings would go to buy medicines and things like that. And uh, this, was, this could happen because there's a lot of medical doctors, psychologists, dentists, spe specialists that uh, don't have a job there. No? So they're basic they basically have to work in data centers or things like this, factories. So yeah, these people were supporting us. Then I decided to organize a stock exchange. This is a stock exchange. It was called eventually the Brooklyn Stock Exchange. And basically, we would offer things like uh, certificates of deposits, um, Zapatista Solidary Bonds, um, and many, many other things. People would invest in them, and me as a banker would have to make that money create more wealth for the investors, while at the same time, that money would be able to fund um, the activities of the different collectives that were running under this economy, which is really hard because money you can spend very easily, but to give it back uh, with, uh, with yield, that's, that's, that's a challenge. Then eventually we had enough money to give a, a grant uh, of another culture. Um, it was this one. And yeah. So Space Bank more and more began to replace the previous work that we had been doing, we were doing, we were able to fund the final stage of the car career of uh, this medical doctor, the, his, his exam and so on. And um, he was at the time living in La Sierra Taromara in Chihuahua, uh, working with indigenous kids. But there, we had problems with getting the money back because he spent it. And he didn't want the money back, so that meant that all of the Clients in the bank are not gonna get their money. No, so this was a challenge to me. On the one side, because I just couldn't go and, you know, beat him. And if I did beat him, I was not gonna get the money back, and the investors would be really angry. And when I'm talking about investors, I'm really talking about friends, peers, collaborators, etc. So this was really big because I knew that he probably was. Uh, paying money to BBVA in some other in some other loan, right? And uh, it was also a big blow because it meant, can we trust our peers with something like money, right? So now we started lending money in uh, through platforms like Kiva and some others to people like in South Sudan and Philippines and, and, and all over the world because we now we had an, a problem with money. We had an excess of money. This didn't mean that we can give it away. It just means that we have to use it. So in order to get the money back from the initial loan, I had to design some bonds, sell those bonds to the initial investors of the loan, do a double or nothing, and have those, each of those comic books that were uh, pawned by this guy. Um, they became kind of like, uh, how do you call them? Like, uh, yeah, like let's say bonds. And he would pay each of these 500 bonds that really were comic books, but he wouldn't get any comic book until he repaid the loan of 500 comic books. And he couldn't cherry pick, like say, oh, I want the Superman number one and, and the uh, San, Sandman number seven, and I don't care about all the others. No, he had to pay the 500. He would get the 500 back at the end. Or if he didn't, every year the loan would be 17% higher in interest, but he could either choose that the 70% was in money no, or in comic books. Yeah. So he also had to do a, a how do you call that a self critique on tape. Yeah, that was important. Uh, then I started designing a, a hedge fund. This is a, a tactical media hedge fund called uh, Sabotage Hedge Fund, I think. Yeah, 
And so within this fund, you have things like um, graffiti, uh, actions, tactical media, Zapatista corn, et cetera, et cetera. So we would buy, for example, uh, Zapatista corn, each, each uh, grain, maybe it costed 10 cents of a dollar, right? So then this corn would be resold to someone as a future, no? because this corn essentially could become uh, a plant of corn, right? Which would give maybe 1,000 grains of corn, right? And so in the meantime, these, these corns would be given on a loan to a farm, uh, to, a, to a, someone doing urban farming, no? who would take care of that corn and then bring back corn. And in this way, we would have helped the Zapatistas by buying very expensive corn from them, right? And the investors would get some money back, but then we also would have more corn, which we could do things like tortillas, no? or um, eventually we made ovens, solar ovens, no? to, to dine there together, etc. It was really an exercise, but it's really difficult. It was really difficult for the farm workers, for, no, they were not farm workers, urban farmers, to understand that they were not ha getting a grant, no? that they actually had to return and we would have to count the grains, right? Because this is, this is how you earn trust, right? It's, it was a, an exercise. So, yeah, this would expose like how, how, how there is no corresponsibility and how like people talk about doing uh, sustainability with grants, no? So that's not sustainable, no? That's interesting. So by, that, by, by then, we were already funding and when I say funding, it, it, uh, okay, like alternative news portals where each of the collaborators would get a chair on the enterprise. This chair could be then exchanged for money for, or, for, or for other things within the stock exchange. But also this website or enterprise or, or, or project had to pay certain things like web hosting, no? Because that was a way to keep uh, to keep the server going on, etc. So it was super complicated, right? And um, eventually, we had like ounces of silver, so a poet could come and write a poem and then say, "You know what? I want to sell immediately my my chair and take back a silver ounce," which was okay for him, but he essentially was um, betraying the economy, the collective economy, right? So okay. Um, I was really inspired by Goldman Sachs. You might remember Goldman Sachs, which is a, a, an investment bank that was funded, founded initially by some Jewish guys in New York who were selling just paper on the street, right? And eventually it became what we know today. They basically, what they did is basically, one of the things they did is, you know, when Henry Ford died, he, the inventor of Ford, he left this wheel so that 90% of the shares, or something like that, would go to the Ford Foundation. And the Ford Foundation was designed to, you know, foster the most amazing things within humanity, which according to Ford were art and science and the humanities. And uh, Goldman's, and I think the union was going to keep like eight or nine uh, percent of the shares and the family like one percent or two percent because he didn't want to have his family become aristocrats or something like that. But then of course Goldman Sachs was brought in and they were the ones that dismantled all of this, you know, that undid everything so that the union became dispossessed, the family bought like all the shares and so on. So I was really inspired by that. But also by Soro, you might remember Soro, right? Uh, Soro, it's a, it's a new Spanish from California, so half, half indigenous, half Spanish. And he's fighting the colonial power, no? But when he's not wearing his mask, he's just an effeminate guy and nobody would give one dime for him, right? So I wanted to be like him without the mask. I wanted to, to run a corporation. And this is Diego de la Vega, which is the name of Soro when he's not wearing the mask. So I started this corporation and eventually got uh, work with, within cultural institutions and um, 
So for instance, I worked in the, as a manager or as the director of the literature department in, at the cultural center in Tijuana. So every day I would buy one kilogram of Zapatista coffee, right? To serve to the people that came to read books. So in that way, we had like, kind of like the city, buying coffee from them, people reading books, drinking this coffee, and Starbucks, which was, which was really close to us, uh, would have a, a bigger problem selling uh, selling coffee, right? Mm -hmm. And I also designed like a like a program of barter of books and and so on. So this is a meeting with the Zapatistas. I think I'm the uh, you can barely see my eyes. I'm kind of like at, at the right. No, this is a meeting with the commanders, and it was like a great recognition for me to be sitting with them discussing arts and culture. One of the problems in, in places like Baja California, you might remember um, the Colorado River. Uh, Mark Twain wrote that um, water, whiskey is for drinking and water is for fighting. You know? And we can see that today more than ever. This is the Gulf of California, which uh, people in Baja California are happy to call Mar de Cortez, like the con conquistador, because for them it sounds m more fancy, right? And uh, throughout the peninsula, we have a lot of indigenous groups that are basically dying, you know? And the, and the team of the governor in the side of Baja California, basically what they're doing is um, trying to give electricity and other resources to California. This is really great because uh, I think the PR person for, for Sempra Energy in, in California was actually the daughter of the governor of, of Baja California, right? So you have all these horrible situations. Also like the WWF, the World Wild Fo Wildlife Foundation, they were involved in this possessing these indigenous people uh, of permissions to, to fish in places where they had been fishing for 9,000 years. This is the Colorado River. It's basically dry because the, the water stays now with corporations in the in California, basically. And this is, uh, let's say, the reservation or the town where these in, indigenous live in Baja California. And this is what the governor on the right is building: you know, energy for the not so sustainable state of California, which requir requires a lot of undocumented workers and energy and so on, right? But you know, the, the war also happens with, within culture. Um, the, previously, the previous indigenous landscapes are being changed by Iberian culture. So it's really cool to drink wine and toast and go to a place like uh, Valle de Guadalupe, right? It's super fancy. And the ideas in people's head are, are changing. And this is part of the genocide that still goes on to this day. For instance, here it says that the Oh, well, the Quiliguas, it's a tribe that already signed a pact of non-reproduction because they don't find any more uh, a reason to live under this siege. And I think that the youngest uh, person is a, is a girl who might be 20 years old by now. No, nobody cares about this fat thing in Mexico and also in Baja California because everybody needs electricity and iPads and Playstations and so on. This is the land of the, of the, um, no, not Cumia, it's the, I forgot the word, not Kili was either, the Cucapas, yeah. So this Cucapas, they have been fishing for many, many years, and we found out that their kilogram of fish, uh, no, the 1,000 kilograms of fish are sold to distributors for kind of roughly $300, $3,000, no, $300, right? So 1,000 kilograms for $300. And these are sold in the market for $3,000, right? So we wanted to, to help them fish, although I'm a vegetarian and I don't like people to eat fish. I was born a vegetarian, actually, and I never tried fish or meat, which made this a difficult project for me. But... So we decided to try and help them instead of doing t-shirts and stickers, which we would buy among ourselves, right? To try and purchase from them this fish to then resell in the city and also pay them more for this. 
At this point, Space Bank was already uh, able to, there were space banks all over or, or in some cities of Latin America. And so we were able to transfer money from, let's say, Bogota to, let's say, New York without actually using the traditional financial uh, world. Yeah. Also inspired by the way that the Indian uh, from Asia, Havala, functions, right? It's basically what the Rothschilds were doing 300 years ago. You now you have persons that trust each other in England and Austria and, and in other places, and you're just, you know, basically counting pieces of gold or beans or whatever. But also this card, the Space Bank card, is, um, has a magnet magnetic band, uh, an individual number, and all of that. So we also ha hacked an ATM in Brooklyn so that people could use it there, right? Because <laughs> as a bank, uh, you have to be everywhere. And what is that word with P? You know, with, with money, you have to be very promiscuous, right? You have to be really promiscuous or it's not going to work. So around then, I remember that actually I was just a writer. You know? And uh, I decided to start this publishing house. Uh, we pay, I think, 10% royalties to the graphic designer, 10% royalties to the illustrator, 10% royalties to the writer. He still gets the bad, the worst part, but he gets 10%. And uh, these books are printed on demand. We print a short run, and then also they're distributed by Amazon and so on, right? And so that's able to bring revenue, but because it's never clear if we're going to be able to sell these books, these books are sold as commodities within the stock exchange. So peop investors buy them in advance so that then later we resell them and then these people get a profit, right? Or they also can get a stack of books. For some reason at that point, the World Bank approached me to do a project with them. They wanted me to have like some kind of branch in their lobby in Washington. I was not too interested in that. What I wanted to do was a, a joint fund with them, you know, to join, to join uh, forces to fight poverty and other things in the world. And uh, they didn't want to, you know, because of many things. And I said, just give $20, you know, $20. We'll make it work together. And they never gave $20. So I had no choice but to accept to be in the lobby of the World Bank. Because if I didn't do that, then my peers in Mexico would have said, you know, it, your project doesn't work. It was a very unpopular project at the time. But because we started having more money and we started understanding deeply what money is, you know, like a Mexican peso is, let's say, a tenth or a twentieth of a dollar, you know, because their relationship is basically oil, you know. And so there are many, many different relationships. For instance, on the left, we have the... The, it's money from the Khmer Rouge in um, Cambodia. You know? They actually printed this currency and then they abolished the money. On the right, we have um, a sol from the revolutionary France. I think this is from the 17th century. And so remember the French restarted the, the calendar and the months and money and everything, right? So we started in researching what is money, like what is backing this money, right? Remember. You might remember Che Guevara, or some of you might remember him. And, you know, for those who do, Che Guevara was not like Jim Morrison, right? He was basically the first governor of the Central Bank of Cuba, you know? So he was the person responsible for designing an economy so that, let's say, the film institute or the film industry of Cuba was able to run. And for this, um, he relied on selling sugarcane and then buying uh, film and camera equipment abroad. You know? I think at a certain point they were wondering if to buy Italian or Japanese equipment, right? But so it shows like the complexities behind all of these things that we as an artist sometimes don't see, right? When we engage with these institutions. So our money museum started to grow. And by working in cultural centers, I found out how, for instance, if you want to do an exhibition with uh, four conceptual artists or performers who nobody knows, and, they, and the cultural house has a budget of, let's say, $1 million, 
you cannot give $100,000 to these people because nobody knows them, nobody's going to come, etc. And so the, the cultural institutions are always looking for content. And they might look, for instance, in Mexico for, um, remember in Christmas they put these uh, nacimientos, kind of like uh, some sculptures that represent God and uh, the camel and all of this. So, so banks like Banco Nacional de Mexico, which is now owned by Citibank of New York, <laughs> imagine that, um, they rent these exhibitions to the state for a lot of money, and these exhibitions are going to bring thousands of people to the museum, right? And so I thought, that's the logic that works, and maybe we can rent this money museum to exhibitions. And the money museum started to travel to different cities that would, again, be another source of revenue for Space Bank. This is the Zapatista two cent coin, no one cent coin from 1915 when Emiliano Zapata took the, the Bank of Mexico, he did this coin and, and the two cent coin. And I think it, it was Pancho Villa who told him, you should do like the 1,000 pesos or something, no? But Emiliano Zapata understood that it was not about money, but about social relationships. And if you wanna have social relationships at a lower level, you, you need smaller denomination uh, units, right? So at that time, I started to think, okay, we're doing all of this, but I'm still working with dollars and pesos, right, and other currencies. So I decided to create a currency. Originally, it was going to be called another mark, or in, as a kind of pun uh, to Subcomandante Marcos. But eventually, it was called the Digital Materials and Flower. And it was originally backed by the digital labor of 10 of these collectives, that were within the economy, let's say 10, which collectively had been able to create something like $17.11 of Google Ads from Google Ad revenue. So Google was only going to pay the money after, after we, we reached $100, right? So what we did is we issued bonds to, to reach $100 and then those $100 would back the, the coin. We were very lucky because this was 2011, I think January, and so Apple computers included the currency within their currency converter. After the second life, Linden dollar, but before Bitcoin, you know? And so that gave us a way to have our money, our currency fluctuate on a daily basis. This is a Space Bank in Occupy Wall Street. We also were not very successful there because people wanted to give donations and we wanted long-term relationships, right? So it was very easy to get $10, but we didn't want those $10, but people to put $10 and decide in what do they want to invest. But uh, Ocup uh, people in general, general in Occupy were against the banks. No, for me it was kind of like, mm, I don't know, suspicious. Then I, I was invited to the Economist Summit in Mexico, and I got to speak before the president, you know, who's responsible for like another genocide, you know, the one of related to the drug on wars, to the war on drugs. And uh, that was really cool because everybody in my panel was speaking about how bad they're doing, you know? and I was just talking about numbers and saying we're doing it with this 17%, 20%, and, and it was really cool and uh, to talk their language and make them look bad. And at the same time, I was able to invite people to attack the president, right? The bad part was that then they sat next to me, so I think it's not gonna work the next time. Yeah, so values, there are, there are many different values, and certainly in Mexico, at least, there's two different ones, no? One is a civilization that is not based on, ex uh, on extractionism, and another one has been based in extractivism since uh, at least 1492 or 1521. Then I started, I got, I got a little bored of banks at the time, and then I wanted to work with the Federal Crown of Moctezuma, which as I told you before, is in Vienna since 1519. And what I did was an alternative reality game or a play where a uh, basement became uh, an underground Zapatista coffee shop where people could come and buy coffee shop for just by signing 
uh, petition to get the financial back to the indigenous. And um, yeah, it was very intense, three weeks of running this cafe, all sorts of stories. Mm. Yeah, there's a couple of good stories that I forgot. Then this spawned a movement in Mexico where people started to do demonstrations asking for the federal crown to return. Also, this currency, the digital material sunflower, allowed us to create relations with a lot of other groups. This one in particular, they're Mayans from Guatemala, and we basically bought their whole production of clothes uh, with this currency. You know, Eventually, they could, if they didn't find anything that they could buy with this currency, they could convert it into euros, dollars, pesos. All of this allowed us to purchase land in Mexico. So now we have 1.5 hectares of land to start to do urbanist experiments, you know? uh, kind of like redraw cities you know? and perform them in, in real life. It's problematic because many of the people that want to join want to be co-owners and they don't want to buy with money but with labor, but they essentially don't know how to work. So it, basically, we would be paying construction workers or aspiring construction workers to become construction workers. So that's not, that is basically a grant, no? That, that's basically a fellowship. And that's not something that I'm interested in, right? So I'm interested in horizontal relationships with accountability and so on, right? So that also showed us that, you know, in people in cities, we basically are used to receiving money or wealth, basically food from the farm, water from from like also the field, or you know. So basically, we are into this possession. You know, there's a completely, completely distortion of what value and labor is. You no, know? as a general rule of thumb, we started talking about value as some service or thing that was. Uh, demanded or asked by another person. So if you wrote a poem and nobody asked you, that's not, that's not labor within this economics, unless somebody told you to do that poem, right? You'll see why eventually. So these are some of the houses that were built in, in that land you know, as an experiment for the end of the world. You know? yeah, they, they go completely underground. Uh, they're, in the year 2013, I was invited to Mexico City to organize, to be, act as a central banker or economist of an economy of, that had, I think, 60 collectives of artists. And uh, we were able, we were to create a currency. It was a time slash money bill or note that I think, I think it was worth minimum wage, Mexican, Mexican minimum wage. It was 50 pesos, so $2.50 more or less. No, actually, no, it was $4. And um, it represented um, a day of a shift of eight hours, right, of labor. So these were distributed to the artists. Uh, the artist, let's say somebody said, okay, I, I, I'm going to write a poem. Okay, how long does it take you to write a poem? Oh, I don't know, a month. Okay, we, we cannot pay you for a month. We can give you eight of this, which meant it's uh, $20 more or less, or... Mm, or something like, I don't remember the hour, so yeah. And the, and the funny thing was that people had so, such a good self-esteem that they said like, no, 50 pesos is so little, uh, my poem is worth a lot, no? So then we would say, okay, then take your poem to the market, sell it in the market, and then bring money into the economy, right? So by doing this exercise, because essentially it was the artist buying, giving money to to the artists because then these people with the bills could buy things from the, the fair, right? So it was kind of like man eats man, dog eats dog, or capitalism, or you know, any other sort of economy, you know? So at the end, I think we were able to create around $2,500. You no, know? uh, one of the things that I purchased was eight hours of um, cardiologist, uh, consults, consultations from a doctor. And I remember artists were super angry, you know, because I was spending their money bad instead of in paintings or something. And uh, for me, it was very shocking because a couple of weeks before, I had seen two colleagues die of heart attacks, you know, and, uh, and I had to explain to the artists why it was so cheap to buy uh, 
one hour, eight hours of cardiologists with, uh, no, one hour of cardiologists with eight hours of labor, no? And um, at the end, people were very sad because, you know, we created $2,500 more or less for, let's say, 600 people or 100 people, a lot of people. So they were like, okay, we're super poor. You know, but what I thought is you don't understand that we can sell all of this money to the museum, right, as, as content, you know. Uh, and in that way, we're also securing a place within the cultural institutions. Or also, we can buy, we can do an investment. Somebody uses silver, let's buy silver. Okay, we don't want silver. There was an investment that was so easy to, to predict subway tickets. No, it was already announced that the value is going, the price is going to raise in a week. No, so you could still buy them for I think uh, something like ten cents of a dollar, and then maybe next week they would be worth double the amount. So these tickets could be could stay within the community to keep a um, protected price. No, because everybody had to move, or we could give away those to the people of Mexico as a gesture, as a performance, in order to you know, win their credibility or their trust or, you know, it's always a problem when, when people are receiving state money. So at that time, uh, people in the government of Ecuador invited me to do a work there. You might remember that Ecuador belonged or belongs to ALBA, the, the countries of ALBA. It's really funny because supposedly they created the Bank of the South to counterbalance the World Bank. And they also have a currency, El Sucre Digital. So I told them, I want to work with, with all of that, right? I'm going to fund this, find, found this company there. And I want to use the trade roads established by the Spanish and Portuguese to take uh, commodities from the Americas to Asia, right? So this got really complicated. And eventually, they asked me to just do a, an infography or a performance and to lie to the crowd. And I said, no, I'm not interested in that. And I started to see like how it's, this is a pattern on the left wing, you know, on, the, on the electoral left wing to just kind of uh, whitewash or, you know, uh, their actions. You might remember that Zapatistas also sent, um, I don't remember how many barrels of oil to the people of Cuba and also uh, many tons of uh, corn as a gesture, as a gift to you know, as a gift, uh, as a token of appreciation so that they continue uh, resisting. They also gave, uh, two years ago, to the migrants in the United States, 4.5 tons of coffee, you know, that was smuggled through the borders so that these groups would organize, talk among themselves, and, and continue resisting against the wall. So, I think in 2014, I decided to go ahead and take the risk of starting um, the Diego La Vega Coffee Co-op as a standalone project because I received a grant from a blade of grass. We purchased this. Uh, yeah, Gabby became the first resident artist. It was really hard to convince her to come to, Mex to New York from Mexico. And uh, we bought this coffee maker that we would take to all of these events to exchange coffee, Zapatista coffee. Uh -huh. Uh, so the Zapatistas are farming there in the mountains, highlands of Chiapas. Then it goes, that coffee goes here in San Cristobal. It's, it's, this is a warehouse. And eventually it crosses the border, you know, through there. It's Mexico-San Diego border, or the, uh, California by California, Mexico-United States. And from there it goes to a post office, and eventually we pick it up in the post office in New York. We, uh, Gabby and I are packing for the, together, for, I mean, this is the first time that Gabby and I packed a box of coffee together, right? It was a f how she started to get involved in the project. This is Mexico City. It's the um, Zapatista coffee shop there. And so with those $20,000 that we got from a blade of grass, I had a problem because you cannot establish a coffee co-op in New York City with $20,000, right? Probably not even in Utrecht or maybe yes. So $20,000 would allow me to either pay six months of rent of a bedroom, no, or to buy some coffee, but not the two things. So what I did is I, I moved with uh, 
persons from a community garden in the Bronx. Uh, this is Brook Park. And they had a kind of warehouse where seven persons were living. They didn't have heating. So it was minus 16 centigrade. Uh, we lived there for six months. Gabby and I started to know each other really in there. We would hug each other and just probably pass out. I'm not sure. I, this, that's my theory, that we would create some warm together, and then we would wake up in the morning, right? But in that way, we were not giving the money to some landlord, right? Because also to get a, a contract as a, uh, you know, the rent, you need to do it for one year. So that would, would have been the ruin. So what I did is I gave that money to the people from the community garden, right? And they were doing, of course, gardening, cultural work, uh, produce, uh, CSAs, uh, organic eggs, et cetera, et cetera. This is our bedroom. You see, you are watching the whole bedroom, really. And we were paying $700 for that. So somewhere in Brooklyn, it would have been much more expensive. Eventually, I decided, because it's double or nothing, that, that I'm going to buy an apartment you know, with that same money. So I went to a, for, to a bank and asked for a loan. And yeah, so this is a coffee bag. So we started distributing. We're, this is Brook Park also, the CSA. Uh, we're delivering the coffee there. It's super cold. Maybe it's not shown in the picture, but it's super cold. We were always cold those six months. The only moments we would be, we would have some kind of warmth was when we went into a restaurant and uh, and dried our hands, no, or when we were in the library. Yeah. This is the coffee co-op. Mm -hmm. And I mean, we were really inspired by you know project like this of uh, New, New Lanark or New Harmony that were created by, um, what's his name, Robert Owen, I think, Robert Owen. Uh -huh. So it's, there's a lot of sources of inspiration. Eventually, 15 months later, I was able to get into the co-op apartment. We were accepted. It was a 15-month long process of Really, you can't imagine what kind of resistance. And basically what I did is liquidate all of the things that, had, that were circulating throughout 10 years to convert that into dollars, no? buy a lot of cashier checks, give a lot of bribes to people, and basically found a way to get into this real estate. Uh, that also was in a cooperative, right? So a cooperative would be inside of a, co of a cooperative, you know? Um, this also became a problem because then we rented a bedroom on Airbnb, which made a lot of money, so now we, could, we would have to distribute the money within the, the network of, uh, of Space Bank and reinvest it internally, you know? It's a complex circuit of relationships. This is the Patoli board. We're gonna be playing tomorrow with the Patoli. It was forbidden in Mexico 500 years ago, and it's basically a ritual to the god of art, music, poetry, romance, and magical plants. And it's also uh, a means of uh, economic exchange. It's kind of like a chess or like Parchisi. And uh, I would want to install one of these in uh, near the genocide site in Mexico City in order to make people talk about this without actually being direct, because maybe it's the only way to get in there. The actual president today, he has, he's the one responsible for giving like a UNESCO heritage protection and INA protection to the coat of arms of Cortez, uh, Christopher Columbus, etc. And he was also responsible for evicting the dancers from the, the actual square, you know? And this is the left wing again, you know? More images of the Patoli. Also, the Patoli is important because it's, a, it's part of a religion. It's an anti-colonial act. Uh, it's an act of faith. Also, uh, many of you might have a relationship with a virgin or with God, and maybe if somebody questions you, you still know that those things were real. Same thing in there. Um, so, yeah, we're thinking about that in terms of like reviving Using in Mexico, you can only do a religion if it's Judeo Christian. No, you can only register it. Everything else is kind of like some wacko hippie persons, and they're not taken seriously, mainly because of all of the artifacts are within the museums and so on. 
more patolis, patolis, patolis. Yeah, we try and play as much as we can, patoli. With Airbnb guests, also it's dangerous to play it, no? Because it's essentially, you know, yeah, it creates all sorts of problems that you cannot imagine. Mm, this is one of the community chests. No, it's very easy to create wealth by uh, playing patoli. For instance, if somebody offers a mint and Xochipilli, the god of art, takes the mint and then maybe he redistributes the mint to somebody else in that game or in a future game in that place or somewhere else. This is a coffee shop experiment that we ran in Williamsburg for four months and that's one of the actual community chests that were created. These are um, seniors playing the, the game. So we have computers in there and many, many other things. This is uh, the 100 um, denomination of the digital material sunflower. We also have the 1,000, the 5,000 coin, and the one bill. This is probably a design of how it's, it was organized, the economy, at a certain time. In terms of cities. Mm -hmm. So in the top is where we could, so to say, move more money, you know, and send back or, or the other way around. So it's complicated to explain all of that. This is one of the invoices of labor that somebody offered to the Patoli or to a time bank exchange, one of those two. Uh, more current version of the stock exchange. Now with digital materials and flowers as, a, as the as the unit instead of dollars. You see, when we think of the Frida and Diego um, Tianguis or market of Tenochtitlan, we think that they were actually dealing with a normal market economy, but actually they had up to seven different types of currencies, you know? And um, it was very a very sophisticated culture in terms of finances and also it, the Mayans invented the zero. This is one of their computers. It's not an abacus. It's uh, called an epowalcincin, and it's, uh, it deals with um, a duo duodecimal. Um, yeah, it's duodecimal, or, or you can also do it uh, with 13 as a base. You know? So it's more like for calculus and that kind of thing. After the corn experiment, I started, I found out that Hollywood, you know, uh, funds a lot of its uh, propaganda movies with popcorn, right? And so popcorn was, was also born in, in, in that region of Mexico and Guatemala, supposedly when the god of the young corn met with the god of fire, and the popcorn popped, right? And uh, popcorn used to be back then used in rituals or as jewelry or in storytelling. So essentially it has maintained that, that same uh, use. So what I did is, again, start selling the pieces of popcorn, right? The pieces of corn, the grains of corn. And then they could only buy this with this currency, right? After that, we would buy, uh, we would convert this distribute this corn to different collectives, which would then sell them in film clubs, small film clubs in Mexico, across Mexico. And so that the money aggregated could allow us to produce movies, you know, other type of movies, and to fund the production of organic corn. Uh, here we are in uh, the place, in the cultural center of uh, a painter called Toledo, he has dealt a lot with uh, my organic corn, uh, but we really wanted to work with organic corn because when you try to find organic popcorn, really it exists only as an idea and there's very few farmers that actually have it. This is another co-op that was born in uh, Colima. These are some uh, visual arts students that had problems with transportation, um, material supplies, and they also wanted coffee, so they started buying coffee from Zapatistas. Initially, they, their, their first kilograms of coffee were bought throughout the Patoli by creating their own social value and, and all of these exercises that allowed to create kind of like the cooperative. 
Yeah, so I really like the idea of working a different version of NAFTA, no? And yeah, more more humane, maybe, and also one that is that takes into account the original, the descendants of the original inhabitants, or or the ones that inhabited there 500 years ago. Uh, New York City still has Christopher Columbus as one of the main statues. And actually, the mayor and the governor of the state really want to protect them because Italian Americans uh, see themselves represented in Columbus. I wonder why they didn't choose like Michelangelo or Leonardo or something, right? So, yes, uh, interesting. Uh, all, many other states throughout the United States are changing the date of October 12 into the day of the, in, the indigenous people. I don't think that's accurate, no. I think it should be either the, the, the day of the indigenous resistance or the beginning of the genocide or something like that, but it's, it's a way, it's a place to start. <laughs> you know, it's a place to start. 20 years ago, uh, you know, uh, it, um, the Americas had officially been discovered, you know. Uh, but now the, the scientists are talking about the encounter between two worlds, you know. So, yeah, it's slowly it's shifting. So yeah, that, that's it. Thank you. If you have any questions, shoot, please. Um, how is this project sort of now evolving, or is it still ongoing, or is it now? been archived? That's a great question. Well, I think, I think you saw the, the final stages there. Um, I mean, the, the last, the, the more re uh, recent stages. Um, now, one of the things that we've done is starting to buy into into the stock exchange to be able to vote within Nike or Facebook or that kind of thing. But it's always going to be relevant, the level that we, of, of involvement. Mm, I don't know where it's going, you know? Uh, because it's very difficult also to create trust. Many people or many peers want you to give them money, you know, and you're not in, in that position. Especially because as we, as, I mean, I started this project when I was 29. Now I'm not 29 anymore, right? So now we're thinking about uh, collective in, uh, collective wills, inheritances, like who's going to receive all of this afterwards. Also, 401ks or how to you know how is it going to be when we're 60? You know, and. Uh, we had a discussion in, in another documenta that we were invited in a project that reminds me that, that, that this one, the not yet, it reminds me of and, and, and. I don't know if you heard about it, and, and, and. No? So one of the discussion was how to, where were we going to retire? And a lot of them, of the artists that participated, wanted to retire, let, let's say, in Amsterdam or Berlin or New York, right? But they're not actually working today on creating wealth to be able to do that, right? But uh, I can see that some of, of my friends who are not working on that would want us to eventually, uh, you know, take care of them. No, so um, we also had a couple of other residents in in the apartment in in New York City. Uh, one of them, well, Gabby initially was sort of undocumented, and then we had another undocumented uh, worker staying there. He was a painter, an indigenous painter from uh, Mexico who had studied art in the university, but who came to New York to work as a plumber. And one of the things that we have to protect ourselves a lot from is from other artists, regular artists from Mexico City, that we want to come into New York essentially to pitch to cultural institutions, right? Because that's, that's not what this was built for. So, and maybe they're not too interested to work in the Bronx or at the Anarchist Book Fair. So and now, uh, throughout this, Gabby was able to also study her MA in labor studies. She's, she was working every day also in finding jobs for undocumented workers or for immigrants in general. 
So every day she would find a job that at least pay $120 for, I don't know, 50 persons, 100 persons, right? Every, every day from Monday to Friday. This was really heavy, you know, because she's an artist and uh, somehow the community became her practice, the migrant community. Mm, I, I, could, I could not participate in that because of like some clash of values, for instance, if we were gonna give them coffee for free for them, they're maybe not interested in Zapatismo, or may, maybe they are like working uh, in relation to the Virgin of Guadalupe or Jesus Christ, so then in, in effect what would happen is that Jesus Christ and the Virgin of Guadalupe are giving them the help. And that doesn't, for me, that's not cool. No? We have to fight the, anti -colo the colonial regime and so on. No? And, and so sometimes you create these horrible ties of dependency. And, and yeah, so. I know my question in the Netherlands not allowed, but uh, in Mexico maybe. Uh, how many money uh, you have now in the in the account? Uh, how much money in, in dollars? Yeah. I don't know in exactly in dollars. Maybe a couple of hundred dollars, if in dollars, or maybe a couple of thousand. But if but all of the collective value is more than three hundred thousand know, dollars if measured in money. But as you know, money is always being converted into something else, and then again it liquidates, it becomes money, and so on. And uh, we were able, able also like to to buy small pieces of gems, like if we went to Brazil, let's say, to a town that had a mine, we would buy some of that or gold. But uh, like I say, it's very easy to spend it, right? But also, one of the things that I don't believe in is the idea of commons, no? because I believe in the idea of collectivity, so people working and being a part of in order to deserve something. This was very hard because I actually, my, my mother is part of the cooperative, but not, other, not necessarily other relatives, right? So for instance, this one time, um, one person who didn't want to work with us, um, she was kind of rude, wouldn't say hi to us, and then eventually she, she got HIV, and now she wanted to be helped. No? So it's, it's this kind of, of uh, problematic where it's really not about money. Money, I think, doesn't even exist. I don't know what money is. I am fascinated by it. I don't know what to do with it. Whenever I have a dollar, I will invest it. No? Uh, I think in 2008 or seven. When, I, uh, when initially I got into the stock exchange, remember I told you that money was frozen and so on, eventually I was able to unfreeze it by saying to the banker, come on, you and I know that this is, this is not uh, drug money. You know that uh, there's drug money in here, but it's not, it's from your, like the, your friends. She was a member of the horse jockey team of the president. And um, so basically they gave us the money, we started investing at the worst possible time, the financial crisis, which made, gave me a stomach because we were losing so much money every other minute. You know? So now, but then what happened is eventually we had a, a small space in, 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 in my mother's house, in, in the garage, and we would do a bar there, serve rum, uh, Cuban rum, uh, Cuban cigarettes, Chinese beer, uh, Zapatista coffee, etc. Zapatista cigars also. And uh, that money would allow us to continue doing research, buy the things that we needed, we would eat collectively. And also, uh, at the end of the, when we did the, the, when we closed the, how do you say that? When, when you do the register, no? We would have some earnings, which would, we would deposit every day into the bank. No, even if they were 50 cents of a dollar or whatever, and then we would buy cheap stocks. No, so every day we were buying cheap, stock, cheap stocks or silver, and eventually the financial crisis passed, and that became a lot of money. No, and money is really a problem because you can only spend it. No, there were other groups that um, we discussed at a certain point. We we discussed at a certain point. You know, you're selling coffee, you cannot deposit the money into the bank because this, this coffee is illegal. No, it's a coffee, it's a rebel coffee. And if you have that money in the bank, then they, they are going to know that, wh where's this money from, no? So eventually we were discussing to buy like trucks or something, but so yeah, there's, there's many, many, many ideas, no? 
But money is a social construct, really. Yeah. Yeah, I am, I'm very interested in, in your remark um, because it echoes a lot of my thinking that you're not so keen on the idea of the commons which I find also very problematic myself as a concept, that you believe more in collectivity. Could you elaborate a little bit on that? Well, yes. It's a very difficult... I don't know what to say. <laughs> You're putting me in the spot in here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it's very easy to uh, misunderstand. To the bar, if that's okay. Yeah, so I, th I think it's very easy to misunderstand ideas like socialism or cooperativism for like free money, you know, I think we'll have a role, the role has to be discussed centrally or decentralized or in whatever way. There has to be an order and uh, we are the economy and you know we, we, are, we can be the banks and we can take care of each other and be responsible. But of course it's always heartbreaking and disheartening and, and real, no, people do get sick, people do have to work and uh, you, cannot, you cannot change that, right? And uh, this is one of the main critiques that Space Bank has gotten because it's, it's not pure, it's also not just metaphoric or symbolic, it's very dirty. And we, we deal with neoliberalism or with, uh, with many, many other things, but you know, so is the Zapatista movement and so is, so is everyone that is in this room and in this world, right? All right, then um, we'll take it to the bar, indeed. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you, you, friend. <laughs>